All right, so a couple more characteristics that I want to talk about on, uh, on membranes. Uh, and then we're going to move on and we're going to talk a little bit about moving stuff through membranes. Uh, so one characteristic of membranes that occasionally shows up, it's not in all membranes, but you'll occasionally um, see what are called microvilli, cilia, or flagella. And really what these are in reference to membranes, microvilli, cilii, and flagella, is these are going to be protrusions from the surface of the cell, from the cell membrane. And we can define them as either thread or tail-like protrusions or extensions. So tail or thread-like surface extensions. And these extensions are going to have a couple different functions. And you can see an example here in this micrograph. This is the cell membrane court sort of in this black color. And so these are actually going to be uh, cilii. Uh, could also be microvilli, but in this case they're cilii. Uh, and then flagella are just going to be really specialized versions of these extensions. And again, they're going to provide some pretty unique functions. I think it's pretty obvious that one of the functions that's going to be provided by microvilli and cilii is the additional surface area that can be, um, can be utilized. So areas inside of organs where we maybe have an interaction that needs to occur across the cell membrane, it would be really nice if we had increased surface area, i.e. the digestive system. We need to move nutrients from the food that we consume into the bloodstream. If we have a high level uh, of surface area that can accomplish that task, it's going to make digestion and movement of nutrients across the cell membrane much more efficient in the digestive system. Okay, so provides additional surface area. These also can be situated and set up in such a way that they provide a whip-like movement or motion. That would be called a power stroke. The whole whip-like movement is called a power stroke. And most of the time, these are going to result in, or, or this function is going to result in movement of extracellular debris. So example here might be the cilia that line the trachea and the bronchioles in the uh, respiratory system that help to sweep the mucus that traps microorganisms and pollutants that we breathe in to sweep them out of the lung tissue. Microvilli and cilii also can be oriented in such a way, organized in such a way that they can sense environmental surroundings and help to pick up information from our surroundings. We see these a lot of times in um, bacterial cells and also in our own immune cells and can reach out and sort of pick up information about what is around in the extracellular fluid, what's around the cell. And then lastly, uh, the flagella in particular can add mobility for the cell. An example here would be the flagella, the flagellum that we find associated with human sperm cells. So those are just some uh, additional characteristics that we may observe in cell membranes. What I'd like to move on to now is a portion of physiology that's known as membrane transport. And this is going to be how do we move stuff across the cell membrane. This conversation really needs to start with the term selectively permeable. I guess I'm really having problems spelling tonight. Is this a big point? Um, we are still under membrane bound proteins. This may not be the best place for this, but 
Um, ultimately, it sort of is because these membrane-bound proteins are going to help out with membrane transport. So membranes are defined as being selectively selectively permeable. Hopefully this is not a new term for you. Hopefully you've run into this term before. But what exactly does it mean? What exactly does it not mean? So selectively permeable just simply means that we can move stuff across the membrane at specific times and under specific circumstances. So we can select what we want to cross the membrane. If I need glucose in the membrane, I can select glucose to cross the membrane. If I don't need glucose, then I'm not going to select glucose to cross the membrane. Okay? And that's what the selectively permeable refers to. Selectively just means we choose based off of need what can cross the membrane. Permeable just simply means that the object can actually cross the membrane or be facilitated to cross the membrane. Now there's another term out there that I want to introduce you to before we move on because it is even in high-end biology programs it's still used as a synonym and it's not. It really is a different word completely. And that term is semi-permeable. And I've heard many biology students including PhD students that I went to school with who use selectively permeable interchangeably with semi-permeable. And that is a tremendous error. And the reason that that's an error is because semi-permeable does not have the ability to select what will cross at a given time. Semi-permeable just simply means that there's some sort of characteristic that allows some things to cross and other things not to cross. Most frequently that characteristic is going to be size. Small molecules can cross the barrier, but larger molecules cannot cross the barrier. We never use the term semi-permeable when we're referring to a biological membrane. Semi-permeable membranes are things like saran wrap that allow water to cross and, cross and gas vapors to cross, but you can't have your mashed potatoes cross through the membrane. So the larger materials don't cross, but the smaller material, materials will. The cell membrane is far more dynamic than that. Biological membranes are far more dynamic because we actually can select and turn on and off when things can cross. So if I need glucose, like I've already said, can turn on for glucose to cross, turn on for water to cross, turn on for a variety of other molecules, sodium and potassium and chloride and magnesium, all can be selected to cross the membrane at specific times. So don't ever use semi-permeable as a an, uh, an, uh, synonym to selectively permeable. So selectively permeable stuff can be moved across the membrane to facilitate cell processes or cellular work. So we may need things inside of the cell for some sort of physiological or metabolic reaction and we need to move material into the cell or out of the cell. Now there's a variety of ways in which we can transport things across the membrane. I'm going to start out with the very simple, which is diffusion or simple diffusion. And we'll work our way up toward the more complex, which will be things like co-transport. So simple diffusion, and I do have a figure here to kind of illustrate simple diffusion. Simple diffusion is basically going to occur and you can see a time, a time scale here uh, of simple diffusion. We start out with a high concentration of stuff on one side of the membrane and nothing else on this side of the membrane. And then things begin to cross. And pretty soon we have equal amounts on either side of the membrane. And this occurs through simple diffusion when it occurs because of spontaneous motion. occurs because of spontaneous motion. And what I mean here is that we're not actually moving this across. We're not pumping it across or physically moving it across. It's just inherently moving because that's what molecules do. They randomly move spontaneously 
and they will cross the membrane as long as the membrane is permeable to that object or that material. This is always going to occur from high, anyone remember what this symbol meant? Yep, so from high concentration to low concentration. Now this high concentration to low concentration is what we're going to refer to as a concentration gradient. Okay? And just simply put, a concentration gradient can be defined based off of the concentrations of material on either side of a barrier. So over here in this figure, I have a high concentration on this side and a very low concentration on this side. During this particular time, we call that a very steep concentration gradient. Whereas over here, we actually have no concentration gradient because the concentrations are equal on either side of the membrane. And then here in the middle is sort of an intermediate. It's still a concentration gradient, but it's not as steep as the original concentration gradient. So simple diffusion is going to be driven by concentration gradients. The rate of diffusion, how quickly diffusion occurs, is going to be defined based off of the steepness of that concentration gradient. The steeper the concentration gradient, the quicker the diffusion will actually occur. So we have molecules that are always moving fast. But because they bump into each other, the overall movement appears very slow. So let me kind of draw this out. These molecules here, they're all moving very, very fast. But this molecule may be moving up this way until it bumps into this molecule, and then it sort of creams off in a different direction. So all of these molecules are moving really, really fast, but they're bumping off of each other, so they're not really moving to uh, any great distances within, within space. They're staying, moving really fast in a very small area. Okay? Occasionally, one of these molecules is actually going to bump into the, the lipid bilayer, and if that lipid bilayer is permeable, it can actually bump into it and can cross. The steeper or the higher the concentration is here, lower the concentration is here, the higher the concentration here, the more likely molecules are to bump into the membrane. Okay, And so we would have a, a larger uh, amount of the material crossing the membrane. Uh, as we move over here to this center portion of the figure, we now have some molecules that have made their way across. These are still randomly moving around. Some of them are actually bumping into the membrane, and they will actually cross back in the other direction. And you think, oh, that's counterintuitive. But really what's happening is even though we may have one or two of these in a minute crossing, the barrier, we have 10 or 12 or 20 of these crossing in the other direction. And so the overall effect is for it more molecules to be crossing in this direction, fewer molecules crossing in this direction. And then once we get to equal here, there's still movement occurring. Stuff's still crossing the membrane, but we'll have one a minute crossing in this direction, one a minute crossing in this direction, and those balance out. So there's no net movement across the membrane. So the molecules are moving around really, really fast, but they're bumping into each other. So in any one direction, it appears to be very, very slow. If I increase the number of molecules on uh, one side of the barrier, I can invariably affect how frequently those molecules are crossing the membrane. Another thing that I can do to change or to affect the rate of diffusion is to change the temperature. If I add heat, these molecules begin to move even faster. If those molecules are moving even faster, there's a higher likelihood that they'll hit the membrane and will cross through the membrane. So I can change the 
the temperature. Uh, on the converse, I guess I could remove a bunch of heat and reduce temperature, and these would begin to move slower, and we'd have a lower frequency of membrane or of mo molecules hitting the membrane and crossing through. So affected by temperature. We also are going to affect things by molecular weight. You actually already experimentally observed this, right, with the potassium permanganate and the methylene blue. The bigger molecule didn't diffuse as fast through the auger plate as the smaller molecule. So just the overall size of the molecule can affect how fast diffusion can occur. The steepness of our concentration gradient can affect how quickly something diffuses. Here, diffusion is actually going to be slightly slower than over here with a much higher or steeper concentration gradient. The surface area, basically how much membrane is available for diffusion to occur is going to cause differences in concentration. If I have a very large membrane, so let me kind of draw this out, surface area, if I have this patch of membrane versus this patch of membrane, all other things the same, concentration, steepness, and things like that, because there's much more surface area here, concentration or diffusion, rate of diffusion is actually going to be quicker because I have more surface area for interaction. And then lastly, the permeability of the membrane. Is the membrane, membrane fully permeable to the object or not fully permeable? Uh, we're going to talk about water here in just a second, but let me give you an example of water permeability. So water can cross through the membrane through simple diffusion in two ways. One is directly through the membrane, water directly through the membrane. This occurs very slowly. We're talking about 100,000 molecules of water per minute. Or, I'm sorry, per second, actually. There we go. 100,000 molecules per second. You're probably thinking in your mind, oh, that's a lot. That's slow? Yeah, that's actually really slow. If I pop a protein in there that acts as a channel for water, it's called an aquaporin, and I have the exact same concentrations of water on either side of the membrane, and that water begins to go through that aquaporin, this makes the membrane more permeable to water. And rather than 100,000, I now have a trillion molecules of water per second instead of 100,000 just by making the membrane more permeable to the substance. Yeah? Will there be any reason for a membrane not to have an aquaporin? It wouldn't make more sense to just have it. Oh, there's a ton of reasons for a membrane not to have aquaporin. Even just in the kidneys, if I don't want to get rid of water because I need to conserve water because I'm dehydrated, I want to remove all of my aquaporins from mm -hmm. the portion of the kidney that's creating urine. Yeah. It also relates to cell size, we're going to find out that if we had open permeability of water through the membrane, we would have water that would be rushing in or rushing out of the cell, causing the cell to swell or to, or to shrink, which is problematic. All right, so simple diffusion, we've talked through that. Let's talk a little bit about osmosis, just so we're all on the same page here. Osmosis is just simply a special form of diffusion that's reserved for water. So osmosis is going to be the simple diffusion of water. So this is a pretty classic experiment. And what you see here is a beaker that actually has uh, a permeable barrier in the middle of the beaker. You can see that right here. And then on either side of the beaker we have different uh, concentrations of solutions. Now, it's sugar molecules, but remember that sugar is matter and so it consumes space. And so these sugar mile molecules, they're able to take up some of the room that would be available for water. 
So on this side, we actually have a lower amount of water because of more sugar, and on this side, we have more water because of the less sugar. And now this is all going to affect this special form of diffusion called osmosis. So water will cross, flow across membranes. And you actually saw this as well with the egg experiment that we did. We had two different solutions, deionized water and sucrose. And the deionized water and the sucrose, it wasn't the whole solution that was crossing the membrane. It was actually just the water. So the sucrose wasn't actually crossing the membrane. Just the water, which was being which was being allowed to cross the membrane, was affected by how much of that solute was present. So we actually had sugar molecules consuming some of the space for water, and we could alter, for the same volumes of water, we could alter the concentration of water by adding sugar into the solution. So water can uh, flow across membranes. And in cells, we've kind of already hit on this. I just want to make sure that you have this in your, I guess I'm going to reiterate this. In cells, water crosses directly through the membrane very difficultly. It's very difficult for water to cross through the membrane. So in a cell, the membrane doesn't really allow water to cross all that readily. And the reason is, is because the water molecule would have to go through that hydrophobic region of the membrane, and that's just not chemically conducive. What was the protein that we could put into membranes that would increase water permeability? Aquaporins. So the aquaporin is going to be a protein channel that facilitates water movement or allows water movement. Okay? So you can actually see our example here of an aquaporin embedded in the membrane, protects the water from that hydrophobic region of the membrane and facilitates a much larger movement of water across the membrane. Now, Inside of the cell and inside of uh, tissues, the extracellular fluid, they are primarily composed of water, but there's other stuff that's present as well. And that other stuff is going to have mass, so we're going to call it matter, and it's going to consume space. So matter, when it's in a solution with water, consumes some of the space that could otherwise be occupied by water. And so by Recognizing this factor, we actually can realize that we can have water concentration gradients. Now, inside of a cell, again, the membrane is a barrier that separates the intracellular fluid from the extracellular fluid. And whenever we have an increase in mass from that matter that's not water, that's consuming the space that otherwise would be consumed by the water, if we have that increase in mass on one side of a barrier, such as a cell membrane, what results is an increase in pressure applied against the barrier. And we call that hydrostatic pressure. So if I kind of go back one picture here, you can see that I have more water here and less water here, okay? And so you would recognize that water can actually go in this direction, can move in that, uh, in that direction from high concentration to low concentration. But it's not that simple. It's not just simply water moving down its concentration gradient. 
because I have more matter on this side, I actually have pressure that's exerted back onto the membrane. So with most solutes, you have your barrier and you have a higher concentration. Maybe we'll use potassium as an example. And when the membrane is permeable, we just simply go down our concentration gradient. But osmosis in this movement of water, so if I draw another picture here, and I have my concentration of water, we're going to move water down its concentration gradient, but with the larger amount of matter, I'm going to say increased mass here, a decreased mass on this side, we actually also have pressure that works against the normal uh, diffusion uh, of, of water. So we actually have two forces here. Is this making some sense? So rather than just the concentration gradient, I have this opposing pressure called hydrostatic pressure that fights against the movement of water across the barrier. Would hydrostatic pressure only be coming from the inside? I'm, I'm sorry, say, say that again. Would hydrostatic pressure only be coming from the inside, like a cellular cord? No, you actually have hydrostatic pressures in, in both directions, but one of them is going to be more prominent. Because it's related to the matter that's present. <clears throat> so with a higher mass on one side of the barrier, you have a higher pressure against that barrier, hydrostatic pressure. Well, what are th what, what's the result of that pressure? Well, in all reality, we actually have some water that crosses back in the other direction. So some of the water filters back across the membrane. So this further compounds or retards the movement of water through the membrane. This is an additional factor that we need to be aware of. Now, just so you kind of uh, understand this, we actually, in a model system, could induce a force against that hydrostatic pressure. So if we, or, or, a, or we could induce hydrostatic pressure, we could increase hydrostatic pressure to a point where we would halt osmosis. So if I draw my barrier back up here, you know, I have my water movement down its concentration gradient. But the pressure that causes an equal amount of water movement in the opposite direction, so there's no net movement of water, that hydrostatic pressure, so this is the pressure, that hydrostatic pressure that halts osmosis is going to be known as the osmotic pressure. The osmotic pressure. All right, so this idea of osmotic pressure, we actually need to account for it when we're talking about water movement and even really just um, movement of molecules in the cell membrane. And the way that we account for it is we just simply quantify it. And we can quantify it as an osmotic concentration. And that osmotic concentration or osmolarity is going to be something that becomes important when we're dealing with composition of the intracellular fluid and the extracellular fluid. So the amount of material other than water in a given compartment on either side of a barrier, we can quantify as a osmol. And typically we put it as a concentration, so it would be over the total volume of liquid. So one osmol per liter. What does that actually mean? Well, one osmol per liter relates directly to the mole, which is a concept you're more familiar with. One mole of dissolved particles in a liter of water is going to equal one osmol per liter. 
But herein lies the cavity. Most of the solutes that occur inside of the extracellular fluid and the intracellular fluid are going to ionize when they're put into water. So we're going to have sodium chloride that becomes an ion of sodium and an ion of chloride. When that happens, whenever we are referencing ionizing material, we actually have to account for both sets of ions. So if I take a salt solution, and, or I take a solution of water and I add in one mole of particles that ionize, we have to refer to them in two sets. So if I take sodium chloride, for example, and I let sodium chloride um, ionize inside of an aqueous solution, each particle, each sodium in chloride is going to have its own effect on the osmolarity of the, uh, of the solution. So each particle has its own effect. Right, so let me break this down with an example. Okay, so one mole of sodium chloride. When put into a solution, it ionizes. And I have a set of sodium and I have a set of chloride. So that one mole of sodium chloride really becomes, in terms of osmolarity, one mole of positively charged sodium plus one mole of negatively charged chloride. And so rather than just having one mole of a substance, I actually have two moles. I have a mole of sodium and I have a mole of chloride. And those two moles are not going to be one osmol per liter, but rather two osmoles per liter. So before I move on here, just to really drive this home, again, this is going to relate to the osmotic pressure. If I take two different beakers, and one of them I put in sodium chloride, and the other I put in glucose. Sodium chloride ionizes, glucose does not. If I put in a mole of each, so a mole of glucose in here, I'm going to have one osmol per liter. And it's going to add just that one osmol per liter unit to the osmotic pressure. With sodium chloride, the same amount of material, one mole of sodium chloride, it ionizes into those two sets and I now actually have a higher amount of material that's going to add to the osmotic pressure. Now, osmoles are too big for physiology, for cellular makeup. So we're actually going to measure this in terms of human physiology as milliosmoles. So milliosmoles per liter will be used for physiology. Eventually we're going to get to a point where we really characterize the intracellular fluid and the extracellular fluid, uh, and we look at the compositional components, the parts of the um, the particles that are dissolved inside of each of these fluids. Overall, the average intracellular fluid osmolarity is 300 milliosmoles per liter. Three hundred milliosmoles per liter. Uh, 
one more thing we need to talk about before we can move on, uh, and, and we've already looked at this again in uh, the lab that we did just a few weeks ago, as this concept of tonicity. And the effects of tonicity uh, are pretty drastic inside of um, cells. And so we want to actually maintain our cells in what we would consider to be a highly isotonic solution. So we really we want to have uh, such a situation where blood or other tissue fluids don't have any overall uh, effect of moving water into or out of a cell. So we basically want to maintain our osmolarity so that this kind of stuff doesn't happen. And that's another example of a homeostatic variable, uh, regulating the chemistry of the blood and the chemistry of the water inside of our tissues and in our bloodstream so that we remain right around that 300 milliosmoles per liter, so we remain isotonic. So what exactly is tonicity? As we've already alluded to, solutions affect volumes and pressures. And whenever you have an effect on a volume, you ultimately have to have an effect on pressure because volume and pressure are inversely related. So solutions are going to have volume and pressure effects on or of cells. And by changing the osmolarity, we actually can induce osmosis. Now, the solutions, when we do change the osmolarity, can be referred to in terms of their tonicity. And really, tonic, the term tonic, is referring to the solute. And so if it's hypotonic, we have a low amount of solute. If it's hypertonic, we have a much higher amount of solute. And then what you need to do from there is you need to think in terms of how much water do I have. And the higher tonicity gets, the less room you have for water. The lower tonicity gets, the more room that you have for water. Because the solutes are going to consume space, right? So if it's a hypertonic solution, I have solutes that are consuming space that otherwise would be consumed by water. So hypertonic means low water. High sol solute, low water. If it's hypotonic, I now have extra room for the solutes. And so hypotonic, which means low solute, is going to have high water. By changing those concentrations of solutes inside of the cell, I'm inducing changes in volume or pressure. And when we induce changes in volume and pressure, we can induce osmosis to occur. We now begin to deviate away from that 300 milliosmoles per liter, and water will begin to move in either direction, depending on how we change the osmolarity. Now, if the solution that surrounds a cell becomes hypotonic, again, hypotonic, hypo means low, tonic means solute. So if it's a low solute solution, that means we have high amounts of water, so we have more water in the solution than in the cell, and so this is going to look like this, where we have more water out here, less water in here, and water is going to rush into the cell. So water begins to enter into the cell. And this leads to swelling of the cell. And if the cell swells, as you can see here, eventually it actually can go through a lysing process where it will burst apart and break. Is everybody got all of this? All right, I want you to participate now. I want you to tell me what's going to happen here. Okay, now the solution is hypertonic to the cell. 
So what is a hypertonic solution going to lead to? Okay, so this is high solute, low water, Okay, so there is low water here, more water here, and water begins to leave the cell. And as that happens, the cell begins to shrivel up because it's not as filled with water anymore. And this can also cause the cell to break apart in mice as it shrivels up. So water goes out, and the cell swivels, no, shrivels. <laughs> We can call it shrinks. Now, how about if it's isotonic? What's that? Okay, so isotonic means that there is no difference in the solute, which means there's going to be no difference in the water inside and outside of the cell. So if we draw this out, we'll try to make this as close as possible. The H2Os on the outside and on the inside of the cell are going to be in equal concentration. And so we are still going to have movement, right? Some water is going to be leaving, but we're going to have an equal amount of water coming back in. So there's going to be no net loss or gain of water, and the cell is going to be able to maintain its normal concentration of water and its normal shape. So the net flow in and out is equal. Cell shape maintained. So by increasing the uh, solute or decrease in the solute in the solution, I'm changing the osmolarity of the solution. By changing the osmolarity of the solution, I'm either increasing that osmotic pressure or decreasing that osmotic pressure, allowing water to increase or decrease in its flow because of those changes in the osmotic pressure. Is this making some sense? Okay. Let me just start the next uh, the next thing that we need to talk about here. Um, we'll finish this up on next Monday. I want to talk a little bit about carrier mediated transport. So we've talked through diffusion, we've talked through this specialized form of diffusion called osmosis, which also uh, requires us to understand that there's going to be that osmotic pressure. Next I want to talk about carrier mediated transport. And this idea of carrier mediated transport is that we are going to have carriers that mediate the transport. We're going to have proteins that will help to allow solutes to cross the membrane. So what exactly is a carrier? These are going to be membrane-bound proteins. So membrane-bound proteins. We are going to find these membrane-bound proteins in the cell membrane, and we are also going to find these in the membranes of the internal organelle. So this isn't necessarily just uh, exclusive to the cell membrane. We also find them, uh, these carrier uh, membrane-bound proteins, in the internal organelle. Now, these carrier-mediated proteins, these, this carrier-mediated uh, transport is going to be surround, uh, uh, associated with moving solutes through the membrane that otherwise normally wouldn't. 
cross the membrane because the membrane is impermeable. <coughs> so we need something to make the membrane permeable, a protein, to these particular solutes. The solute that is going to cross is going to bind its specific protein or a specific protein that will allow its transport across the membrane. Again, it's going to be very specific here. In other words, glucose can be transported by a carrier-mediated transport protein, but it has to be a glucose transport. It can't just be a channel through the membrane. It's got to be a specific carrier of glucose for glucose to cross. We'll have specific carriers for sodium. We'll have specific carriers for potassium. We'll have specific carriers for amino acids and nucleic acids. All of these solutes, dissolved substrates in the solution of intracellular fluid, extracellular fluid, are going to specifically bind specific carrier proteins to be moved across the membrane. So the solutes are actually going to act as ligands. And those ligands will specifically bind to carriers to cross. And this is known as specificity, which is not necessarily just limited to, holy cow, specificity. Specificity is not necessarily just limited to carrier transports. Enzymes are going to have a high level of specificity. Receptors are going to have a lot high level of specificity. There are an estimated 20,000 to 30,000 genes in the human genome that code for between 100 and 200,000 individual proteins. These proteins that are produced are very, very specific. There are eight different versions of proteins that carry glucose alone. And they'll carry nothing else, just glucose. So specificity is going to be very, very important. In order for glucose to be transported, we need a glucose, glucose transporter. Now, when carriers transport solutes, this can occur very quickly or very fast. And we've already seen this with the aquaporins. That would be a very specific carrier type protein. And it allows water to cross the membrane at a trillion times per second rather than a hundred thousand times per second. So it happens very fast, but it also will saturate. And what that means is there is an upper limit of the number of molecules in a given unit of time that a carrier protein can allow to cross. <coughs> 